Buongiorno a tutti, buongiorno ai presenti. Good morning to you all. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning uh, to you all. My name is Massimiliano Vatiero, and I teach at the Trento University. Welcome back to the Festival of Economics. Today's presentation has a question as a title, how can we slow down climatic change? This is a question that we're going to ask at all uh, our guest speaker. It might be superfluous to highlight the importance of climate change. And we know that climate change is very much the focus of a public debate worldwide. Climate change is a hot issue for the public at large. And there's a wide consensus on the need for strong action on the part of governments. Our guest speaker is going to refer to the fact that the measures, the policies that national governments uh, uh, may adopt are wrong at times. So as economists say, they are suboptimal or inefficient. And uh, he is probably going to refer to good practices and to bad, bad practices adopted on the subject. Let me introduce now our guest speaker that I see is already with us. Hi, Per. Per Krusel. He is an um, economics professor at the Stockholm University. He is the president of the European Economic Association which is the most important association of economists in Europe. He got his PhD at the Minnesota University, and then he taught at uh, other universities, uh, such as uh, the um, University of Princeton, um, Rochester, Northwestern, before going back to Stockholm. He's going to refer to the importance uh, of uh, his research, Professor Krusel. Has uh, written extensively on international reviews of economics, and more specifically on the five most important academic journals in terms of economics, are those that are named the top five journal uh, uh, for economics. Professor Cruzel has carried out important work in the field of research. He was been awarded an ERC, which is the most important financing for research at European level to carry out research on the very subject of climate change. His research project was focused on the macroeconomic research. Professor Grussell, in fact, is a macroeconomist, a microeconomist, and um, he's analyzed the interactions between climate change and inequalities. Having said as much, I'd like to welcome Professor Grussell. Uh, welcome to Trento. Welcome to the Festival of Economics. Welcome to the Museum of Science, MUSA, which is the place where we are hosting this meeting today. And you have th some 30 minutes or so to so have some time for a Q&A session. So you're kindly invited to speak slowly so as to allow for the translation in Italian. Thank you very much, Professor Grussell. Over to you. Thank you. Can you hear me? It's perfect. OK. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to come to Trento. Unfortunately, I'm not in Trento. I'm in Stockholm in my apartment um, now during these difficult times. Uh, let me go straight to the, to the presentation. The question here is climate change and how to slow it down. What should we do about climate change? And as you heard in the introduction, there is a scientific consensus that humans cause warming, that warming can be substantial. There's a little bit less agreement, uh, or at least there is uncertainty, on how much warming there will be and exactly how warming affects human welfare. But there is a consensus we should limit emissions. So that is not my question today. My question is, how should we do it? 
So, okay, but how? Uh, so this is where economics comes in. Uh, the how question fundamentally needs to be answered based on an understanding of how our societies work, how our economies work. And natural scientists, they are great, but they are not good at this. Uh, and engineers are also not good at this. I think many natural scientists and engineers think they are good at it, but I don't think so. So as economists, we have now a golden opportunity to help the world and showcase actually also to economics skeptics what our subject is useful for. And most importantly, if we don't so solve the how question in a smart and a cheap way, I think the world's populations will accept ch climate change. We will not do anything uh, because it's going to be too, too costly, uh, too difficult and too costly. So how, uh, what, is the, what is the principle or what do economists propose? From a classical economics perspective, actually the problem of climate change is very easy, it's trivial. Uh, the logic is the following. Um, warming, uh, warming is a byproduct of economic activity. It's some, something that happens when we do climate, uh, economic activity. But it's a case then that we call pure externality. It's something that is a byproduct and this makes market uh, market systems fail. So markets are not good at dealing with this. However, actually exactly 100 years ago, an economist uh, solved the problem. He figured out what to do. And his name is uh, Arthur Pigou. And in 1920, he said, let's use a tax equal to the damage that is this externality, the byproduct of economic uh, activity that this, the polluter uh, is not paying for. The reason why the market isn't working well is that there is an extra damage that the polluter is not paying for. So Pigou said, let's use a tax and make the polluter pay. So if you use this tax, then markets work well. Uh, without the tax, they don't, and we get climate change. So nobody has really argued with Pigou uh, because Pigou's logic is very solid. So since 1920, we all agree on this. Um, in this particular area of climate change, uh, carbon that we emit in the form of carbon dioxide, it spreads super quickly in the atmosphere. Um, so if I drive a motorcycle in Trento, or I drive it in Beijing, or I drive it in Stockholm, it has the same effect. So the externality is exactly the same. So therefore, the tax should be exactly the same in Trento, in Beijing, in Stockholm. So the solution following Pegu is a uniform global carbon tax. Uniform means the same in all places. Uh, this is a picture of Arthur Pigou uh, when maybe he's thinking about, about uh, externalities. So uh, we have been repeating this message. Economists have been repeating this message like parrots. But I think the result has been not so good. Mostly we had no effect. Politicians are not really listening to us. There are some exceptions. One is some countries have climate change, uh, cli uh, have um, carbon taxes. Sweden has a high carbon tax, but also in the EU there's a trading system that is similar to a carbon tax, and that's also good. But the exceptions are very few, and they are only uh, relevant in uh, in countries that emit relatively small fraction of the total world emissions. So the question now is why are people not listening to economists? Uh, and 
there are some candidates. One, it that it's maybe the tax sounds strange. Can we really trust the tax? Um, it sounds more natural to do other things like regulate. Uh, another possible explanation is that people don't understand why a tax is so good. A third reason is that they might feel that the tax is not fair to some people. So in this presentation, I will focus a bit on explanation two, that people don't understand why the carbon tax is good. Uh, I will also touch on uh, explanation three. So this is uh, illustrating uh, that we repeat carbon taxes and pigou taxes like parrots, uh, but people don't listen. Okay. An interlude here is actually a self-critique. Uh, I would like to uh, suggest that economists are actually not so good at explaining things. We have beautiful insights and formulas. We have, if you study economics, uh, I believe some of you uh, who listen now or have studied economics, we read in our textbooks about conditions for optimal behavior of firms, households, government. Often this is expressed in abstract mathematics, uh, we use so-called marginal conditions. The Pigou tax is an example exactly of this. And there is also a nice formula to calculate how big the Pigou tax should be. So this is all, this is what we do. But what we are not so good at is explaining why our solutions are so much better than these other solutions that people suggest. Um, and actually, it's even worse than this, I think. Um, economists are not so used to comparing to other alternatives that are not good. We, we actually don't know why. And I think in many cases, what we propose is not much better. It may be better, but only marginally better, only a little bit better. So uh, the question now is in this area, uh, um, what what? Is the Pigou tax much better or is it just a little bit better? But, but in, in general, I think we have to be self-critical in economics and, and ask ourselves, is our proposed solution so good, really? Uh, I found this picture. This illustrates self-critique. All right. So <clears throat> how much better is the Pigou tax than the alternative? So in my recent research that I have carried out together with two colleagues in uh, Stockholm, John Hassler and Connie Olofsson, we have examined the Pigou tax and compared it to some alternatives that other people propose that politicians like uh, sometimes and that are worse. But the question is, how much worse? This is a picture of John Hassler and this is a picture of me to the left and Connie Olofsson to the right, so th this is the team. So we, we looked at three particular ways of not following economist advice. The first one is that you use the right kind of policy. You use a global uniform tax on carbon, the PIGU tax, but you set it at the wrong level. You set it either too high or too low. So we looked at that type of mistake. Another mistake is that you use a carbon tax, but you don't use a uniform carbon tax. You use different tax rates in different parts of the world. This is very common uh, for politicians to propose. Their argument is fairness. Uh, for example, in developing countries, should we really require them to tax carbon when they are struggling? Uh, so that's you know, a, another deviation from the PIGU principle. A third one is to not tax carbon, but instead, um, instead of taxing carbon, we promote green energy. So these are the, these are the three alternatives we have looked at. Um, and we found that the mistakes from not using the carbon tax are actually very costly. We did not know this, so this was not expected. We, we had no idea. We looked at the, these alternatives that people mentioned, and, and uh, we got a little bit scared. So let me quickly report these findings. It, first of all, it's very costly, very costly for humanity to set the carbon tax 
that is at the wrong level if you set it very low. So if you hope that climate change will not be very big or that it will not be very difficult for us to deal with, not very costly, then it's, it's <clears throat> if you believe that's true, um, but it turns out to be wrong and you really should have taxed, that is very costly. The second thing is if you let the developing countries um, use no taxes, but we use taxes in the rest of the world, it's also very costly. And finally, if you don't tax carbon and instead uh, use green uh, investment policy, it's also very costly or at least very hazardous, very dangerous. We have one exception, which is a mistake you can make is that you set a high carbon tax uh, thinking that climate change is not, um, sorry, thinking that climate change is very drastic or costly when actually it turns out that it's not so bad. That is not uh, very costly. So actually, if you act thinking it's very bad and you set a high tax, that's okay. It, it involves a cost, but a very small cost. Um, this is a picture of the person. So this is Nordhaus. I hope you saw his, uh, listened to him the other day. Um, William Nordhaus developed the kind of framework that we have used to answer these questions. This, this is actually a picture of Nordhaus when he is visiting Stockholm to uh, receive his uh, Nobel Prize. And if you see in the picture here, there's a little shine, shiny uh, object on his jacket. This is actually a replica of uh, of the nobel prize he, the nobel prize is big it's huge and it's very heavy and it's made of gold but this one is is uh, just a symbol so it's a very cool thing to have on your jacket because very few people have it okay so what what is it that nordhaus helped us with nordhaus helped us construct quantitative theory is what we call it his first model was called dice um obviously celebrated. It has equations from natural scientists, sciences and economics. And these equations are calibrated, like you calibrate a thermometer, you calibrate the equations so that they match uh, historical data. Then you can use these equations to simulate um, paths of economic outcomes and climate outcomes based on different policies. And the equations also allow you to have well-defined notions of how good or bad this is for human welfare. So the model uh, in this case is analyzed using a computer. It's not so easy. Uh, you can't just use pencil and paper. You need to program and that's what we have done. So now let me show you um, the results, the basic results. The, the first picture is just to emphasize some important things that are well known. So this is not our contribution, but it's, um, so it's, it's important to understand. The, on the x-axis, you have time. On the y-axis, you have uh, the, temp the global temperature. And here you see some curves. Uh, the first three curves are basically on top of each other. It is how warming will evolve if you have no taxes or if you have taxes in the EU. The, the red curve is if you have taxes on all forms of carbon. The black curve is if you have a tax only on coal in the EU. And what we see is that taxing in the EU, it doesn't really matter much. You don't help the world uh, in terms of lowering warming. Uh, almost at all, you can't see the difference here. So this, this, this first point down here, taxation only in the EU doesn't help at all. Why? It's because we are such a small part of the world. Uh, so no matter what we do in the EU, we just can't solve the climate problem. The second important point is that if you use a global tax, and either on all sorts of carbon or just on coal, you move the line down uh, quite a lot. So from in year 2200, without taxes, you're almost eight degrees warming. Uh, 
but you go all the way down to three degrees, if you tax uh, carbon uh, or only coal in, <clears throat> in at the level, and I should say this level is at the level of the EU tax right now. At um, So even the EU tax, which some people think it's too low, that tax helps a lot. You know, th the difference between this point and this point is huge. So a global tax is great. You also see that even here, it doesn't matter if you tax all forms of carbon or coal. What's the difference? Well, the green line does not tax gasoline, does not tax pet petroleum. And you see that it doesn't matter. So the second point is uh, warming is all about coal. Taxing oil or not makes no difference. Why? Because there is a very small amount of oil compared to the amount of coal. So stop using oil. It doesn't really make a big difference. The big difference is coal. Okay. Finally, you see a blue curve or a turquoise uh, curve, and that's the Swedish tax. So the Swedish tax rate is very high. So if we all use the Swedish tax in the world, you would get warming down to um, just about two degrees. Uh, but the key thing here is that you, you can achieve a lot by using the EU level. You don't have to go all the way to the, the Swedish tax, um, but you have to use it globally. All right, so that's a little bit background. Now let me show you uh, how to compare the PIGU tax to alternatives. The first one was that you used the right kind of tax, but at the wrong level. So here you see a curve. Again, it's time on the x-axis. On the y-axis, you it's not temperature now. It is how much you lose as a fraction of all of our consumption. So it's a little bit like fraction of GDP. Um, and what you see here is two curves. One is the black one. It describes when we set a low tax, but the correct level is to have a high tax. And more precisely, we have set the tax here to be close to zero, when actually the damage is based on the pessimistic scenarios in the IPCC reports. Okay, so then you see that by the year 2200, the losses are very large. I mean, the losses over here are similar to a permanent Great Depression, if you know the, the depression that happened in the 1930s all over the world. So by the time we get to 2200, we are in a very bad shape if we use a low tax and it reality turns out to be bad. However, if you use a high tax, when actually climate change isn't very big or climate change doesn't hurt us very much, then you get the costs down here, the red line. And you see that these are just a couple of percentage points of GDP. So in other words, it makes a difference which kind of mistake you made, make. If you set it too high, it's not a big problem. But if you set the carbon tax too low, it's a big problem. And I think this is a very important argument why a high carbon tax is an excellent precautionary instrument. It protects you in case you turn out to be wrong. The second policy experiment um, is what I said, that you use a, a, a carbon tax, but you don't use the same level in all countries. So let's take it, just one example here. So the idea here is, suppose we want to limit heating to 2.6 degrees. This is still quite high, but 2.6 degrees by the year 2165. Uh, but let's allow Africa and India uh, to not use any taxes. So let's let them off the hook, as they say in, in the US. Um, so they have no tax, but we are taxed in the rest of the world so that we hit the 2.6 degree target. Here you see the welfare consequences in different regions of the world. So on the y-axis, you see, again, consumption loss, percentage consumption loss. And you see that the gains in Africa and India, these are the two bars here, they are 2% of their consumption, roughly. 
But we lose. We are all below zero. EU loses more than 5%. The US loses almost 20%. China loses more than 5%. And, and these other regions, Oceania and so on, also lose. So in total, we, we lose a lot and they don't gain much. Okay? So a non-uniform tax is a very bad idea because it would be much better to have a uniform tax and compensate Africa and India in other ways, okay? So it's just not a good proposal to say not tax, that to not tax uh, carbon in Africa and India. Okay, the third example, uh, and my last example, uh, is, is maybe the most popular one, which is push for green innovation. Everybody likes it, uh, but the point here is suppose we only do that we don't use a carbon tax we don't don't use a fossil tax so suppose there's no pigu tax but instead we make green technology more productive over time with some kind of government policy in the example here we set two percent improvement per year compared to all the other sectors of the economy so the green sector just gets better and better and better and in 10 years time, 2% per year means a lot, and 100 years, even more. So here are the results. So again, you see on the x-axis is time, on the y-axis now is we have back temperature. And <clears throat> the key lines are really the green and the black. The black um, uh, is, sorry, let's, 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 look at the, let's look at the green only. The green only shows you that uh, you have significant warming. Uh, here we don't go all the way out to 2200, but if we did, you would see that you would go all the way up to eight degrees. So it doesn't really help to have fast green innovation um, if you don't change anything else. So neutral coal, I'll explain in a moment. So this result is a little bit strange maybe, but. The, the key thing is it doesn't help the climate. Why? Because green energy helps us use more energy. Energy becomes cheaper, we will use more energy. But in all our calculations, it doesn't really get rid of coal. The reason is that coal and green energy are not very good substitutes. It may be that they may become very good substitutes in the future, but right now they are not. Economists have estimated how close substitutes they are and we base our calculations on those estimates of how good substitutes they are but it turns out they're not very good substitutes and that's why green innovation it's good because it creates more energy but it does not get rid of coal so green subsidy is not a good pigu tax substitute what you can see in the graph is if you have slower productivity growth in the coal energy production. And you could see this stagnant coal here, uh, the blue and the black. They mean um, that these are down here. That is that regardless of what happens to green, if coal production is less and less efficient over time, that's good for the climate. Why? Because then coal will not be used so much. So this is a little bit like taxing coal, okay? so. What you want to do in the end is get rid of coal. That's the important thing. And green technology doesn't necessarily get rid of coal. So if you like green technology, fine, but you have to make sure it gets rid of coal. That's the key insight here. And we are very worried that the world's governments will push for green energy without making sure that they get rid of coal. The, the beauty of the Pigou, um, insight is, well, how do you get rid of coal? You just tax coal, okay? If you tax coal, you get rid of it. Why? Coal is not very productive. Coal is not very profitable. Um, in the US over the last 20 years, the coal industry has almost disappeared. Why? Because there's some competition from other energy sources. And there, just a small amount uh, of competition that turns out to be a close substitute uh, we'll get rid of coal. A small tax would also have gotten rid of those industries. So 
whatever you do, it has to make sure to shut down coal. It's just that globally, we don't have a good um, substitutability between green energy and coal. So my conclusion here is actually mostly, it's not my own work, but mostly it is that it's a very productive area to work on economics and climate change. We can evaluate common policy proposals and we can help uh, determine how good or bad they are. And in our experience in the last few years, uh, we have found that many policies that are proposed are really very bad compared to a PIGU tax. And it's our job to explain this to politicians, to the public. We cannot hope that others will understand it. If anyone understands it, it's economists. So we, this is what we have to do uh, our job. But in a general sense, what, are, what is this study? We have to do cost-benefit analysis. Um, and we always do cost-benefit analysis. Cost-benefit analysis applied to climate change. It's just a very, very important topic. And that's why we should be active in this area. Others don't know how to do it. So even though it wasn't obvious to me uh, before doing research, I'm now actually even more convinced that taxing carbon globally, uniformly at a high rate is the way to go. Uh, and let me finish with then repeating like a parrot the message of Arthur Pigou. So I'm done. Okay. <clears throat> Grazie, uh, Professor Krusel. Thank you very much, Professor Krusel, for this fascinating presentation and uh, for the very clear arguments. We're now collecting questions, uh, and I'd like to invite uh, those who are attending the meeting and those who are following the meeting online to voice their questions. Uh, and I'd like to recognize myself asking a question to Professor Krusel, Krusel. As you know, in Trento, there's a very close attention to the subjects of local uh, autonomy. So my question is has to do with uh, what the local government can do with the local what the local community can do to tackle the challenges of climate change let me just refer to Elinor Nostrom who's the first woman being awarded the Nobel award uh, for economy uh, her research has been focused on the opportunity for the local community to govern certain uh, areas that are similar to the ones that you refer to. So the question as follows is what the local community can do, what contribution can come from the local community to try and solve this problem? I, my, unfortunately, um, my answer is not much. Uh, this is a global problem. It's not a problem that you solve on the local level. Um, I understand that many people really want to help. Uh, and I mean, this is true in many parts of the world, maybe not all parts of the world, but certainly true in Sweden. Everybody wants to help. And I think the, 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 the frustration is that it is a global problem. Actually, the most important thing in the world is that China stops using coal. It doesn't matter what you do in Trento. I'm sorry. It doesn't matter what we do in Stockholm. We have to, what we have to do is try to convince our, our politicians that this is a global problem and it has to be solved in global collaboration. Uh, Eleanor Ostrom's work was fantastic, but it did not have to do with commons problems, of externality problems on a global scale. They had to do with problems that were on a local scale. This is a global scale. Uh, that is also why it's so difficult. We have to educate ourselves. What you can do in Trento uh, is to educate others outside Trento. So, for example, actually, in the case of Sweden, um, we had some very good initiatives, and we were able to influence the European Union to change the system for, car, uh, for um, 
tra trading permit. So this system we have in, with um, um, trading permits for um, carbon dioxide in Europe, it didn't work very well before. Now it works much better uh, because this, there were some Swedish politicians who uh, informed, partly by economists, uh, proposed and managed to change the system. So actually insightful knowledge can help politicians make better decisions. And I think that's the best thing we can hope for. Unfortunately, we cannot do much in Trento. Ok, raccolgo una domanda eh, There's a question that has been uh, placed by actually two questions. Beatrice has asked a question. Who should have the authority? Who should introduce this tax? International organizations are not legally binding. So there could be some free riders. There's another question. There's another question, please. Thank you. Second question. Do we need greater international cooperation and greater culture, among, uh, greater dialogue amongst people of different cultures? Over to you, Professor Grussell. Um, absolutely, it has to be some form of international collaboration. But an important point is that we don't need a world government. We, the tax can be applied by even by the Trento uh, municipality. Uh, you can collect the taxes locally. So long as we all agree that we tax, uh, it doesn't matter what we use the revenues for, but we all have to tax. So if China imposes the, a tax, um, great the revenues from the tax go to the Chinese government. They could do whatever they want with the revenues. The important thing is that they tax, okay? So we need to have international discussions to try to agree to tax, okay? But again, the, the implementation is local. So there are ways that, for example, Nordhaus has been discussing that you can have um, climate clubs or ways to... Uh, combine trade agreements with a requirement to tax. So, for example, we can import goods from Italy without any tariff unless the Italians uh, don't tax carbon, then you have to pay a tariff. So, you know, you can combine the tax in, in um in these uh, climate clubs, uh, Nordhaus and other people call it, that is one way to try to get rid of the free riding problem. There is a free riding problem, absolutely. But this is why the governments need to talk to each other. Uh, and when they do that, they have to realize that if they don't agree, it will be very costly. And it will also involve some compensation because as you see, um, some areas will be more affected than others. And so it's important to, to come up with compensation for the losers. Uh, but on that, we can gain if we talk to each other. Okay. Abbiamo un'altra domanda. There's another question uh, that Luigi is raising. China is uh, still building a coal power station and relies on coal for 94 for 49% of its energy consumption. So how can we act on China uh, in terms of coal consumption? Do you uh, trust Xi um, in uh, the uh, turning away from coal in 2060? Oh, him personally. I, I have met the prime minister actually, but I have not met the president. Uh, no, I... I China has recently said that they will uh, they will implement very um, very important changes to try to deal with climate change. I think we still have to wait and see what they will do. I, I as I said, I agree. China uses a lot of coal. Um, I think there are two things that make you know could be good. One is that. Um, 
coal um, coal powered plants are bad for the local pollution and the Chinese don't like that so they don't like coal plants so much um, so I think that stops them from expanding too quickly um, but I think there are also ways to you know there's something called carbon capture there are ways to use coal but maybe filter so that the, the carbon dioxide can be kept um, and stored and there are techniques for doing this and right now they're expensive but that type of technology could maybe be used and we can help the Chinese install these kinds of carbon capture technologies. I, th I think carbon capture is potentially very important but more generally what we can do is we can try to also help with green innovations that are that can be translated to Chinese uh, circumstances so that are close substitutes to coal. But, you know, that depends on the region and so on, exactly what they will look like. But it's a big challenge, and but we this is what we have to think about, not about what we do in Europe. Okay, abbiamo un'altra domanda da parte di Lupo Benatti e chiede... So we have another question. What is the most uh, realistic uh, way to involve uh, countries uh, and uh, agree on this uh, universal tax uh, on CO2? So is there a way to do that? Well, as I said, I think the, the best way is to, <laughs> to try to explain that the alternatives don't work. Okay, so this is partly just education. I think most of politicians don't understand that the alternatives are not good. So I think I think that's important. I think it's also important to do some form of compensation for the ones that we lose from a carbon tax. And there will be people who lose. So it's important not to for, forget compensations. But in general, um, you know, I'm not a politician, but I think that there is a big gain for everybody at the world as a whole. So you just have to sit down and think about compensation packages. I think many, many um, politicians have been unwilling to do that. But I think going back to my first point, a basic point is that people don't understand uh, that the alternative is bad. Oh. Okay. Allora, il tempo a nostra so the time uh, uh, available to us has uh, ended. I would like to thank uh, Professor Crusell, uh, those present, uh, and uh, all the best. Uh, thank you.